Everyone, welcome back. Today we're taking a look at the Lawton Audio Snare Microphone, and I'm joined today by Paul Raymond of Full Send Studios. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? Uh, I'm Paul Raymond. Uh, I own Full Send Studios, and I've been recording music for the last 12 years. So what's your normally like your go-to snare microphone? Uh, my favorite drum mic used to be the i5 until we did this video and we compared all four microphones. Uh, we've compared the snare mic, we compared the i5, the 57, and the Beta 57. My go-to is always the i5, and if I didn't have an i5, I used the Beta 57. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the drum kit that we're using today for this? Today we are using my Truth Custom Drums. They are seven ply, all birch. We have Remo heads on them, and we're using Minel cymbals with all DW9000 hardware. So we ran all of these microphones into a four channel Black Lion API clone. Uh, and those are all fed into the RME Fireface 2. So miking the drums, we'll start with the snare. Um, we've got the uh, SM57 Classic. Uh, we have the Beta 57. And then we have the Lawton snare mic. And then we have the Audix i5. I've got them placed on here. Um, I put the snare mic right towards the center, kind of at the sweet spot, because the video is about that. Um, as far as where everything was hitting, this is about where it was. So pretty much the same distance. The end mics are a little far out, but we didn't have a whole lot of room for mounting, so we used the Audix um, drum mic kit to mic up these three. And then this is on a separate stand. I tried to get them as close to the hit point as possible. It wasn't perfect, but for the purposes of this video, it'll be fine. Um, the snare mic is kind of front and center for everything. Um, we chose to go with the uh, further in, it's about two inches in. So with this stuff, we were going for kind of a thicker snare sound. Um, the more angle you have, the thicker it is. The less angle you have, the more uh, snap off the head you'll have. We followed that right along with the um, Tom mics. We got the Audix D2 and D4 uh, on the Tom. Same thing, higher angle, straight down. That's gonna help you reject the cymbals as well. In the kick, we have the Beta 91A and we have the Beta 52, the classic combo. Nick Sampson and Chris Turner have a great kick mixing video out um, that I was fortunate enough to help them on. Um, so go peep that. Symbols on the hi-hat, we have the um, SM7B, uh, one of my favorite hi-hat mics. It's very articulate, that cuts out a lot of bleed. On the stack and on the ride, we have the Lewitt uh, LCT 140 Airs. All the switches turned off. We have those close mic'd. We chose those for these particular symbols because um, they're very crispy and airy, um, and that's exactly what I'm I'm personally looking for in a stack and a ride symbol. And then on the crashes, we have the Earthworks uh, SR25s, um, and they are my favorite overheads ever. They sound great. They're super bright. They're super detailed, super clean. Um, they sound amazing overall. And then on the China, we have it bottom mic'd to cut off some of the brightness and some of the attack. Uh, we have that mic'd up with the SM7B as well. And the bottom snare mic is a uh, Beta 57A. Did you do anything different processing wise with the microphone than you would normally expect to? No, I, I did everything pretty much the same. Ran all four top snare mics through um, the API clone. And what we did was gained them all accordingly with the snare mic being a condenser, it was a little hotter on the input, so. And then we ran that into Cubase. In Cubase, we processed everything with the Slate Digital drum gate deep leader. That is like, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the best cymbal deep leaders um, out there, if you dial it right. We ran that into an EQ, cut out some of the lows, some of the highs, and a little bit of a uh, boxy mid area. And then we ran that into an envelope shaper on each top mic. And then we we bust all the top mics into the snare group. The, the first step was EQ, um, ran it through another EQ, ran the drum gate again, just to take a little bit extra off. After the gate, we ran it into the ozone vintage tape and then the ozone limiter. 
just to uh, take some of the transient out and thicken it up. Were you kind of expecting to hear like a little more of a difference between all of these? I expected a little more of a crispy top end, um, but the low end is exactly what I would expect from a uh, condenser on the snare. Doing the ghost notes and the snare roll sample we got, you can, you can tell that the sound is more dense all the way through it. The lowest ghost notes all the way up to the hardest hits, um, the low end was very consistent, which is a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I could see that depending on your snare and your setup, yeah. that could be desirable or yeah. not desirable. Yeah, so it being a condenser, it's a lot more sensitive. So it's almost like with your lesser hits, it's like almost turning the volume down on the same sound. So it's still full. It just gets louder and louder and louder. Whereas with the other microphones, the quieter you hit being dynamic and less sensitive, the less low end is there and it, it's a little bit more subtle. And then as you get into the mid-range hits, then that low end starts to creep up. And that, that would be my selling point. And if I was recording drums, you know, three, four times a week, it'd be an easy sell just due to the ghost notes alone. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not recording that many. I don't think necessarily geared as much for home studio right. users as much as like professional studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think applications you know, on top of like a professional studio recording drums all the time. I think one of the better applications of it would be, you know, drum content creators that were doing stuff at home. You get a really nice thick sound. And like I said, the selling point is you really hear that low end and the ghost notes. So if you're, you know, a technical drummer, jazz drummer, something like that, it would be really, really good for you. You know, and I really like that, I guess, from an engineering standpoint, just because like, getting that nice fullness out of a snare is something, you know, something that I struggle with sometimes. So, you know, any help you can get with that's always welcome to me. Yeah. Another good difference, and I think it's important to point out, it's noted right in the Lawton uh, literature on the microphone, is the all brass housing. 
Uh, so hopefully it should be a lot more durable than the 57s because um, we've had issues with those in the past. Errant drummers getting a little carried away. The issues with the drummers, not the mics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I could definitely see playing a, a factor um, if it's something that you're planning on keeping for a long time, though, knowing that you can wail on it and it's not going to get beat up. I don't think it really has a huge place in a lot of like home studios just because I feel like the price is going to be kind of prohibitive from a lot of people. How much is it? Uh, $400. Yeah, I, I think at the personally, I think at the price point of 400, I probably wouldn't spring for it just because at the high end hits, it sounds very, very similar. There's about a 10% difference of thickness in the uh, Lawton versus the any of the 57s or the i5. If I was recording drums like every day, it would definitely be worth it because the ghost notes are very full and they sound like the snare. One of my big problems with the 57s or the i5 is the ghost notes get really thin, but in a mix, they tend to disappear a little bit. But like I was saying earlier with the condenser being more sensitive, the low end of the ghost notes is there. So if I was doing drum videos or recording drummers, you know, two three times a week, it would be worth it for sure. So if you're doing a lot of solo drum content, it would be a great mic for you because you'll get a lot of detail in those ghost notes. You'll get a lot of low end detail in the snare. One of the features I forgot to mention, and we didn't really um, go into this with the demos a whole lot, is the low cut and the high cut that the snare mic have. I suppose those are probably gonna be more for rejecting bleed from cymbals and other things than something you would necessarily want for the overall sound of the snare. Yeah, I mean, your snare frequencies are pretty much right from like 150 up to 1K is like the main source frequency. So with the with the high cut at 12K and 5K, that will really cut down on cymbal bleed. But we we didn't use that in our demo, and it rejected the hi hat pretty well. Yeah, that was I guess one of the more noticeable differences between like the um, the 57 and stuff was not necessarily the tone, but just the rejection of everything yeah. else around it. Particularly like the beta, I feel like picked up a little more. Um, surrounding noise not really that would be an issue in a recording setting or whatever but I could see it making a difference live yeah. thank you for tuning in today hopefully you guys got what you came to see which if you clicked on this video you were interested in the Lawton snare microphone uh, if there is another microphone you'd be kind of curious to see how it stacks up against that you think you know we missed drop a comment down below and we'd love to try and add that on at some point if you enjoyed the content, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends. I want to give a big thank you to Paul for coming out and helping with this all week. Uh, it's been quite the little project. <laughs> and also make note that like this is a mic, these are all microphones that we've bought. This is not a video that was uh, paid for or a sponsorship or anything of that nature. So this is just our opinion.